Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ben White, Chief Economic Correspondent for Politico. So good to be with you and to be with Milken again, albeit uh, dispersed around the globe and not together in Los Angeles, but it's uh, wonderful to be with you nonetheless. Um, I write the Morning Money column for Politico, which a uh, shameless plug to start. You can find at uh, politico.com slash morning money. Uh, we've got a tremendous group of panelists with us this, today to discuss a critical issue on a lot of people's minds right now. And that's the extent to which financial markets can continue to be or improve in being a force for good uh, in the world. Uh, and why it is that skepticism is growing to a degree that markets may be disconnected from the economic experience of millions uh, in the U.S. and around the globe, especially uh, given the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, markets doing well, a lot of uh, people in the underlying economies around the world not doing as well, uh, and perhaps benefits from market recoveries accruing to uh, those in the upper income uh, strata and not as much uh, to those uh, who are in uh, lower uh, areas of the uh, income streams. Um, so we're going to also talk about uh, regulation, the extent to which uh, we need to rely on regulators to any degree to encourage uh, financial markets to direct uh, capital and resources to companies that are actively engaged in issues like climate change and uh, economic inequality, uh, or if the market itself uh, is moving in that direction uh, through ESG and other means whereby uh, it's incentivized to really allocate capital to uh, companies and areas that are uh, enhancing the public good uh, in many ways. So that's the, the broad set of topics that we'll be talking about. We'll also take some questions and answers from the audience at the end. So I hope those uh, watching uh, on the live stream will send your questions and I'll certainly take a look at them and hopefully uh, ask our group of very smart panelists uh, who I will introduce now. Uh, we're lucky to be joined by Kate Barton, who is the Global Vice Chair of Tax at EY. Uh, Michael, uh, uh, sorry, Mark Machen, who's President and CEO of CPP Investments. Uh, Jeffrey Solomon, Chairman and CEO of the Cowan Group. Uh, and Andrew Weinberg, founder and managing partner, uh, CEO and chair of the investment committee uh, at Bright Star Capital Partners. So we are very thankful to have all these very smart uh, people with us to try to unpack some of these complicated questions. Um, I'm going to start with a question that will go to, to each panelist uh, to take kind of a broad view uh, of where we are in the recovery from COVID-19 uh, in markets. Obviously, markets have performed remarkably well uh, in the U.S. and uh, elsewhere around the world, even as underlying economies uh, have not done as well. And I'm thinking about the U.S. and the increase in uh, initial jobless claims today and the amount of job creation that's happening. Uh, so there does seem to be a little bit of a disconnect between markets and uh, the underlying economy, at least here uh, in the U.S. So my question for each, uh, just to start, is you know, why have markets been so kind of ebullient uh, in the face of this global pandemic uh, and some numbers that are not encouraging on the spread of COVID-19 in the fall and winter in, in both the US and, and other countries? Uh, and is this likely to further enhance a view uh, that markets are not necessarily operating fully in the public good and then uh, instead kind of uh, you know, making the rich richer and not helping out uh, the rest of the population? So uh, I thought we'd just start with Andrew to uh, kind of give his broad uh, thoughts on that uh, topic. Thanks, Ben, for the opportunity, and thank you to the Milken Institute. If we take a step back in time to March, I don't think we'd use the word uh, buoyant or optimistic uh, about the future of the markets. We saw a lot of uncertainty, markets down, trust and transparency really impaired. Uh, over the past few months I, think, months, I think we've seen a lot of progress in terms of government intervention, a stimulus, and essentially a bifurcation of business into essentially the haves and have nots. Uh, I focus more of my time on the private markets, which tend to be more fundamentally driven and less effectively news driven, a bit slower moving. And the markets I focus on the 25 to $50 trillion wealth transfer in the US among family owned businesses, we've seen tremendous resiliency. We've seen businesses function and operating, some very different than they did pre COVID, but quite a bit of resiliency. So I think in this case, in terms of being a force for good, I think the function of the markets has led to trade finance continuing to work, access to capital markets, whether debt or equity continuing to work. Uh, and I think on a go forward basis, that trust and transparency will be helpful as hopefully we come out of this uh, as one. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Kate, uh, to you, uh, that same sort of broad question, and I think you may have some slides to share with us, but um, you know, where, where do you see the state of play being now in terms of 
you know, recovery of uh, broad economies versus performance of markets? And does that uh, give rise to more of a complaint uh, by people that, that markets are disconnected somehow from the underlying uh, economies and people's experiences? Sure, Ben. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you as well. We see ourselves in the middle of the uh, pandemic and the crisis, and certainly uh, the tax codes of countries around the world have been used quite a bit to really stimulate the economy. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing things not be as bad as they are right now. And so maybe if we want to show uh, the slide, we're seeing really the tax codes be used by countries around the world. Maybe next slide. Um, we have had an onslaught of legislation. Uh, there's been $27 trillion put into go uh, by governments around the world, put into the economy uh, through taxes to fund uh, really the stimulus efforts around the world. And I will tell you that the countries around the world are in debt um, to an enormous level uh, to, to make this happen. And so one of the things that I think we should expect is that uh, the tax codes will be used again to pivot from, you know, this growth policies to revenue raising at the right time uh, to pay this back. So I think that's going to be something that we all need to watch for. And so um, that would be a big deal. The second I just wanted to quickly um, comment on is the changing roles. If we could move to the next slide of tax administrations around the world. I mean, it was amazing that they really served as the data warehouse of governments. Uh, they ended up uh, distributing the stimulus checks in many countries. Uh, they have done some of the contact tracing that's been necessary for this pandemic. And so the bottom line is they have really digitized their systems. And so as a result, they were able to help governments really help their citizens in new and different ways than you would have thought uh, just beyond collecting taxes. And so this is, I think, a good descriptor. And this will have a lot of interesting consequences to taxpayers in the days ahead, too. So it's nice to see the tax code be used at a time when everybody really needs um, some relief. Ben? Very, yes, thank you, um, Kate, for that. And uh, you'll notice that uh, she has a Boston accent. We've learned that she's a, a fan of the Patriots and the Red Sox. And those of us uh, who are Yankee fans will forgive her for that. Uh, we'll, we'll allow it on this panel. Um, Mark, I, I, I want to go to you, uh, which I, I don't think I did, um, just for, for your thoughts uh, on this particularly broad topic. Yeah, I, well, I, I think it's been well articulated what, what's been happening here. I mean, the, the only other thing I would add in terms of what's happening in the macro environment is, well, you've seen this global collapse in income, you've seen interest rates go to zero, you've seen this huge fiscal stimulus as uh, well articulated, including the, the, that tax-driven element of it. Uh, and uh, and you've seen, uh, obviously supported by monetary policy, so as some people call it MP3, uh, is going on here. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing a lot of direct, um, direct spending, direct cash going to companies, going to individuals. It seems like roughly 50 cents of that is going into spending and about 50 cents on a dollar is actually going into markets, going to cash and liquid assets. So you're seeing a build up in uh, in individuals' balance sheets, families' balance sheets, and bank balance sheets, um, and that that's you know one of the reasons for the uh, the reflation that's going on. So you've seen a significant asset reflation uh, that's happening, but you're not seeing goods inflation yet because demand is still suppressed by the pandemic. And there's a lot of differentiation, uh, as Andrew mentioned, in that there's the haves and the haves nots, and it's similar in different assets as well. So you've seen obviously a spike in gold, uh, but oil still depressed to some extent uh, since where, when it went into the crisis, although it rallied back a lot since the uh, since the trough. And you're obviously seeing tech being very strong, financials uh, being a, a little less strong than that. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot that's going on there. And then you're obviously seeing the huge acceleration of uh, the digital economy and the, the adoption of fintech and telemedicine and, uh, and uh, you know, e-commerce and to some extent edutech, uh, depending on where you are in the world and all the infrastructure that supports that. Um, so, um, you know, there, there's some of the themes that are happening. I mean, one of the things that we are very focused on as a, as a long-term investor, a long-term asset manager is long-term uh, wealth creation and companies making the right decisions in the long term. So I, I chair uh, focusing capital on the long-term global FCLT global. And one of the things we've seen and uh, working with McKinsey is 
companies that are really focused today on product innovation, uh, on marketing and sales, on talent and R&D, these types of things that build long-term value uh, are the ones that are going to create the, the most value in the long term. So that's what one of the indicators that we're looking for for the longer term haves, if you will. Um, well, I'll uh, pause there for now. A lot to talk about. Yeah, very good. Um, thank you for that. And, and Jeffrey, uh, to you, just uh, your, your view on where markets are now vis-a-vis -vis <clears throat> underlying economies and their recoveries and the extent to which, you know, to continue to focus this a little bit on markets being a force for good. There is this uh, sense out there, and there was after the Great Recession, uh, you know, sort of the general sense among a lot of, uh, you know, citizens in multiple countries that the markets are disconnected from, um, you know, the common experience of uh, workers. Uh, where do you think we are right now? Well, I think quite simply, markets are simply discounting they're discount mechanisms for future cash flows. And what the markets are seeing uh, is that we're going to get through this pandemic at some point, uh, that it's a health crisis that's going to get solved at some point. And we will go back to some degree of economic activity similar to the kind of economic activity we saw prior to the crisis. It won't be exactly the same, but it never is. Uh, and so markets, if you just do a five year discounted cash flow analysis, they will discount the next 12 months. Uh, and then they'll go back to some norm, more normal uh, way to discount earnings streams. And, and so as long as there's fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus that can bridge us from where we are to when that begins to happen again, uh, markets will be reasonably sanguine. And I think one of the things that we're learning is because of the monetary stimulus that's happened globally and because of the fiscal stimulus that's happened, uh, it's really made the election in the United States secondary. Uh, regardless of who's in the White House and who controls the Senate, uh, there will be a fiscal stimulus package and it will be big. Uh, it may go to different places uh, depending on who controls uh, the legislature and who controls the White House, but it's coming and the market has a pretty good understanding of that. I mean, for us, I, I think what we think about and, and we think about finance as a force for good, we, we think that uh, functioning markets are always good. I will tell you, everybody uh, uh, probably on this call to some degree got bailed out by the Fed. Uh, and so kudos to, uh, to the chairman uh, for learning from a lot of the problems that we had in the previous decade. Uh, if they hadn't made those steps uh, you know, early in March to create liquidity for the financial sector, uh, the, the plumbing would have gotten pretty gummed up. And uh, I think you would have seen a complete contraction in liquidity and we'd be looking at a whole different set of problems. And at least we don't have those problems. So I think sometimes uh, you know, people say, you know, this is a big bank bailout, and I get all of the politics associated with that. The reality is, regardless of where you are in the socioeconomic ladder, uh, functioning financial markets is always a good thing for you because in the absence of functioning uh, uh, functioning financial markets, um, there's chaos and generally a pretty significant depression, which nobody's happy with. Uh, so I think the rest of the panel, we're going to talk about ways that finance should be a force for good, and it, and it can be and it should be. Uh, and in many instances, uh, those of us at the financial markets uh, need to be more focused on our license to operate. That's been a theme here uh, at the conference so far. And I think there's many, many great things that happen uh, for the betterment of society because of finance. Uh, and we just need to make sure that we, the financial institutions and, and the rest of the market participants to focus on those. Um, the more we can get them to do that, the better off society will be as a whole. Yeah, um, Jeffrey, let me just follow up on that question uh, for just a minute, because I've had this ongoing uh, kind of frustration with Wall Street for having this idea that more fiscal stimulus is you know, immediately forthcoming in the United States. Uh, and it, you know, it hasn't happened. And there's been this endless fight uh, over the size of another stimulus package. And now we've seen today that it seems impossible that uh, it's going to happen pre-election. And I agree with you that it's likely to happen post-election. Um, but if we do get a President Joe Biden, let's say, uh, and a Republican-controlled Senate, the prospects for a big number seem a lot less than they might be if uh, you had a Democrat sweep in which Biden uh, wins the White House and Democrats control the Senate, and then he could pass a you know three trillion plus uh, stimulus bill. Do you, do you think there is some level that um, market participants are, are too sanguine about further stimulus uh, in the U.S.? Or do you remain pretty confident that that's uh, that's coming? I'm I'm pretty. I'm pretty sanguine about the fact that there's going to be stimulus. I think we can debate the size and where it's going, but regardless of who controls the uh, the legislature and who controls the White House, it's coming. Why? Because it needs to come. Like, it, you know, uh, it, w there's no debate over whether or not there's going to be one. It's just what it looks like. That The, the big debate mm -hmm. here 
is is the size, where it goes, how much goes to big business, how much goes to individuals. You know, those are the things that we're debating, but there's nobody saying we shouldn't do it. And so as a result, there's going to be that. Uh, and, and, uh, and nobody wants to get out in front of this and give the other side a win before the election. I got it. I mean, that's, again, not unexpected. Uh, but once we get some clarity on, on how the election turns out, there's no reason not to get it done because if, if one side is viewed to be uh, obfuscating or, uh, or, or or blocking a fiscal stimulus package, that would be really bad. So everyone's going to want to get something done. Uh, and I, I do yeah. think that that will happen. Right. Well, I hope you're right about that because obviously it's uh, it's needed for a lot of people who uh, continue to suffer in the wake of this and the, the size of uh, the population in the U.S. still on some type of uh, unemployment benefits that run out in the end of December. Um, we're going to move on in a minute and drill down more specifically on uh, ways in which markets can be uh, a force for good and uh, how they're doing it now and how they might change in the future. Um, but I wanted to talk post-election scenarios uh, with you, Kate, for just a minute, given, given that there are big implications for tax policy uh, in the outcome of this election, particularly uh, if Biden wins and Democrats take control of the Senate. He's made very clear that he would raise the corporate tax rate as soon as he possibly could, not back to where it was, but up from the Trump tax cut uh, level, and that he would raise taxes on high income earners over $400,000. I guess as you are talking to clients uh, and explaining to them, you know, potential ramifications for this. Um, what are you What are you saying? What do you think are the significant implications if we do get this scenario that polls seem to indicate we might, which is, um, you know, a Biden win uh, and then Democrats in control of the Senate? That's going to be a big change uh, for a lot of folks in the corporate sector. It will be Ben if that happens, and so you know our clients right now are really preparing for the, what we're calling the blue wave, or everybody's calling the the blue wave, just in case you know everybody's modeling. And so you know at the heart of it, as you said, is moving the corporate rate from 21 to 28 is where it seems to at least that's what um, uh, Biden has suggested. And um, second on that is that he would suggest a 15% tax on. Uh, book income, which is really interesting. There's a lot of companies out there with unrealized gains that would be subject to tax if um, that particular proposal goes through. And then there's um, uh, increased taxes on global minimum taxes if you're offshoring or have activities outside the country. So there's some additional taxes there. And then, of course, on the individual side, uh, the tax rate would go up to close to 40%, 39.6%. Uh, for individuals that are over $400,000. So at this point, most companies are trying to model this out so that they can be prepared and you know really try to influence it because the election needs to happen and then the whole um, process to legislate has to happen and there'll be a lot of uh, gives and takes. So this is just a suggestion right now and uh, the process will probably move quickly, uh, but it will still be subject to, um, to influence. Yeah, very good. Um, thank you for that, Kate. And I want to remind our panelists anytime if you hear something that somebody else says that you want to jump in on, please feel free. You don't need to wait for me, but I'll uh, continue to go around and, and maybe try to drill down a little bit more into uh, you know, the subject uh, that we're here to talk about, which is markets as a force for good. And I thought, Mark, you might be able to tell us a bit about the role of institutional capital and in investing in innovation, especially around uh, green energy and climate change uh, and the extent to which, you know, that's ramping up and that's really happening. Um, give us your thoughts on that. Sure. And I, I, maybe I'll just give a shout out for one other force for good being uh, maybe a little self-centered here, which is pensions. <laughs> so one, one, one of the things that pensions do provide is, uh, is that dignity and financial security in retirement that uh, we, we all hope we will have. And particularly in a world of the haves and the have-nots, there's a lot of people in the world who are going to, and in the developed world, who are going to have to depend on their pension uh, for financial security in retirement. So it's one of the things that uh, clearly creating the sustainability of our fund is something that we work for uh, every day, and that provides the the, the bedrock of uh, financial security for Canadians across the country. Uh, so that, that's one thing on, on climate. Uh, I mean, this is clearly one of the world's biggest long-term challenges right now. We are facing this slow burning crisis, uh, which may be upon us, you know, like a pandemic. We knew it could come 
and it was on us suddenly. Uh, the same thing could be happening with climate change. So I think that's one of the things that policymakers around the world in certain countries, like in Europe, have turned their mind to and said, look, we should seize this opportunity to make a real uh, difference on climate change. One of, the, one of the things that is clear is that technology and innovation has got to be a key part of it. Uh, Bill Gates said this recently, uh, and it, it's, it's really important that we find technologies that take carbon out of the atmosphere, keep carbon out of the atmosphere. And so carbon capture, for example, is one of the key areas that we've been focused on. We invested in Alberta, which is one of the oil and gas producing areas of Canada. Uh, and we invested in something called the carbon, uh, the Alberta carbon trunk line uh, a few years ago. And this is now up and running as of this summer. And when it's at full capacity, it will take the amount of carbon out of the, uh, out of the system and put it in the ground. Uh, that is the equivalent of all the cars on the road in Alberta. So about 2.4 million cars, so about 50 million tons of cars a year. It's a, it's a, it makes a difference on a local scale, clearly, uh, but that, that won't move the dial globally. But these types of technologies are going to be key in reversing the damage that's been done to the atmosphere. And we're seeing huge amounts of innovation in this area. It's what one of the technology solutions that we see with relation to climate. Clearly there's a huge uh, amount of investment in renewable energy as well, as renewable energy has got more competitive. We, we just bought patent energy, uh, just well, actually just during the crisis, we closed it, which is a $6.1 billion investment for us. And that, that has uh, uh, wind and solar in North America and in Japan, uh, and that's increased our, our investments in renewables. We continue to look for opportunities to invest in renewables. It's a highly competitive sector. It's really good for the world. Finding the right returns is also key for us. So we're, uh, we're, we're looking for uh, you know, good risk adjusted returns. We, we found them, we've invested in hydro and wind in Brazil. We've invested in solar in India. Uh, and so we've invested in North America, in Canada and in, in the US in, in wind. And now we're, we're investing more in offshore wind in Europe as well. Um, we have a joint venture with Enbridge uh, where we're putting more money into offshore wind uh, off the coast of France and other countries in, uh, in Europe. So I think th this is a track, this will make a difference over time. And the more that governments can do to move policy in the direction that uh, stimulates technology innovation and the acceleration of the transition of uh, from from a carbon-based economy to a low-carbon economy, the better it will be for the, the long term for the world. Yeah, very good. Thank you for that. I, I should pause and say here that obviously the world is very focused on COVID-19 right now, but our you know, thoughts are obviously with all those suffering through uh, all of the terrible fires that have happened in California, other areas of the United States, and uh, arguably, you know, a uh, uh, an impact of climate change that's already upon us. And to some degree, I think it's taking our eye off the ball a little bit that we can only deal with one massive crisis at a time, but this one is uh, is upon us and uh, and will only get worse. Jeffrey, I wanted to ask you um, the broad question of, you know, is doing good compatible with good business? And uh, as uh, as Mark was just talking about finding reasonable uh, risk, risk adjusted rates of return and how is Cowan approaching uh, this idea that these things go together and markets are not just a place for, you know, rich people to make themselves richer and to get the best rate of return possible. How do you do uh, good and good business at once? So I, I'll, I just want, before I put up my slides, I just want to echo uh, something that Mark said, because I don't make the pitch for CPP and other, other firms, other organizations like CPP, you know, those organizations are investing on behalf of individuals. So this right. idea that individuals aren't participating is actually, a, I'd like to debunk that notion. Uh, if you're a pensioner, you're participating. If you have a 401k, you're participating. If you've allocated your money to a professional investor, you're participating. Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes that gets lost in this idea that, you know, the markets themselves are for professional investors. Those professional investors are oftentimes managing money for individuals. In fact, and most of the money in the world is owned by individuals ultimately, and they just pool those assets in places like a CPP to make good investments. So when you find uh, an opportunity to make the world a better place through finance. We, we like to think about it in three buckets, so your head, your heart, and your hands. Uh, we all wanna do better. I mean, I think it's human nature that we wanna make the world a better place, whether that's through sustainable investing or 
healthcare investing or um, any one of a number of things that make the world a better place. Uh, but you've got to do it with an ROE that's uh, that, that's acceptable because at the end of the day, you owe a duty to the people that gave you the money uh, or to your own investments to make a, an attractive return. So we call that your head, right? So you want to do it with your heart, you want to do it with your head. And at the end of the day, uh, you have to do something with your hands in order to make it happen. And that may be investing, it may be, uh, it may be giving money to people who are doing something with their hands. And so if you put up the slides for a second, I'll show you what we're talking about in two areas. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of them is, uh, so there's something that happened in the United States in 2012 called the Jobs Act, uh, which basically opened up a pathway for capital to flow to small emerging growth companies. Um, it was a bipartisan piece of legislation um, that, that Obama signed that basically made it easier for small companies, uh, we call them emerging growth companies, to get access to equity capital in the public markets. Uh, over the course of the past eight years, a thousand companies have gone public in the United States. And the one industry that I think has benefited most has been biotech. And when you look at the number of biotech companies uh, that have done financings, there's been 400 of those 1,000 companies that have gone public in the US have been biotech companies. The number of follow-on offerings that they have done has is close to uh, 1,200. They've raised over $200 billion in, uh, for new drug approvals. And when you look at the new drug approvals, there have been 418 total new drug approvals in the last decade. Drugs that most decidedly would never have been financed. Um, and when you look at the budget of NIH or any other non uh, uh, of sort of public funding vehicles, they can't hold a candle to the amount of money that gets uh, raised in the public markets to, to do drug discovery. In fact, if you look at uh, some of the leading candidates that are doing vaccines like Moderna, right? Moderna's access to the public markets is what is partly what enables them to be able to uh, focus a lot of their energies on the COVID vaccine. You can make the same argument for everybody that's doing it. And so here's a good example of a piece of legislation that unlocked and unleashed the value of finance to do the right thing, which is to raise money for companies that are decidedly making a positive impact uh, on a number of patients who would otherwise have no health uh, or no, no hope. Uh, and so if you flip to the next slide, I'll, I'll carry through on something else that Mark said, which is sustainability. Uh, organizations have to make sustainability a core business principle. Why? Regardless of who's running the world, we're going to be trying to figure out, uh, individuals have already said, we should try to be carbon neutral by 2050 because it's the right thing to do for the earth. And that's something you say with your heart. But how do you invest with your head? Well, you've got to develop investment strategies. Uh, you've got to, you've got to uh, uh, find those uh, on behalf of people. Uh, stand in the middle. We do a lot of research in this space uh, that's led us to recognize that the uh, electric vehicle market is literally uh, just about to be unleashed over the next decade. Obviously, uh, we, we did an investment today uh, in a company called Proterra, uh, which does electric drivetrains. Um, that, that's one of the largest um, electric drivetrain manufacturers for buses uh, in the world. Uh, if you look at what we did with uh, a few, few weeks ago for a company called App Harvest, uh, which is uh, essentially doing hydroponic growing in, in the poorest counties in the country, uh, in, in, in eastern Kentucky and western West Virginia, raised them close to $350 million to grow tomatoes and lettuce uh, in some of the most impoverished uh, 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 neighborhoods and in, in, in towns uh, in the country. That is finance doing what it's meant to do, which is to create a wonderfully sustainable, non-GMO, non-pesticide oriented organic growth uh, in a part of the country that was seemingly forgotten by a lot of people. Uh, and, and so I look at those kinds of opportunities. I say, this is financing. None of that gets to happen unless the investors, folks like Mark, uh, folks like Andrew, uh, and the people that they represent are willing to invest in things that actually work from an ROE standpoint. And so I, I do think uh, if you make it a focus, you can find positive attributes. And in many cases, some of the successes that we're seeing uh, making the world a better place are because they got financed in the private markets. Yeah, very good. Jeffrey, thank you for that. Um, Andrew, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the role of the middle market here, uh, given your uh, specialty uh, and what role it plays in the, the recovery, uh, how important it is uh, and how you know important it is to you know, the broad uh, swath of uh, the American public and, and elsewhere, um, you know, middle market companies, uh, you know, receiving significant investment uh, and being able to uh, continue to provide and sustain jobs, even as we go through a relatively challenging economic period given COVID-19. Ben, thanks for the question. Um, the middle market in the U.S., if it were a country on its own, would be the fourth largest global economy. 
and a driver in the U.S. of rough, roughly one third of jobs in the GDP. I'll take in a little bit of a, of a personal story because I think it ties into what Jeffrey and Mark and others have been saying. Um, I'll take in a story of, of, of a cell phone or, or, a, or a tablet or something else that might help us in our everyday lives today, even more important during pandemic. And so in the middle market, we've been able to use finance for the force of good to do the following. So when Apple creates a phone and relies upon trade finance and manufacturing in Asia, and that phone comes here, uh, uh, we're able to kind of start with a company, Global Resale, uh, uh, that we own and partner with leading manufacturers and, and other players in the sector. So when that phone reaches end of life, uh, it might end up, again, having a second or third life, or it might be a tablet or a server that's helping power the, the video system we're using uh, today. And then it takes a second journey, which is needing critical infrastructure. And we'll talk hopefully about infrastructure today, but whichever uh, a party uh, takes the White House, there likely is going to be a large infrastructure bill, and I hope it'll support digital infrastructure. So my kids can continue to learn, so my wife can continue to practice medicine, and all the other developments that come out of that infrastructure, all coming out of the middle market uh, here, here in the U.S. And finally, we invested recently in a company focused on device protection. So we've aggregated many devices in our lives, uh, phones, uh, tablets, hopefully wearables and soon health wearables that'll tell us what our blood oxygen levels are or other vital statistics so we can communicate with our providers how we're feeling. Uh, I do a daily attestation every day, as I'm sure many do, using those devices. And so that journey has all been enabled by that middle market, by that resilient middle market that's gone back to work, some in person, some remote, uh, but knows that they need to work hard to help get us out of this uh, pandemic. So we're very optimistic about the resiliency of the middle market. Many of those companies have been through multiple administrations, so transcend essentially the political system, and again, have shown that culture and that backbone that we look for, and, and essentially really focused on good values. Uh, and in return, uh, um, we as others do on this call hope to be a good partner to those companies to take the next steps in the journey. Yeah, and let me just follow up with you for one second because I feel like I've heard about infrastructure uh, coming soon to the United States uh, for you know years and years. Uh, and infrastructure week was supposed to be pretty much every week during the Trump administration and hasn't happened. Uh, and digital infrastructure in particular being kind of a critical thing, as you said, for people like your wife to practice medicine and all of us to do what we're doing now. And uh, you know, kids to be able to telelearn if they have to continue to do that, with, which God willing, they won't have to because I think all of us are tired of it. But what, what gives you that confidence that uh, that type of infrastructure investment uh, uh, will eventually materialize. Well, I see it in a bit of real-time basis. I had a chance earlier this week through the Milken Institute to speak with Chairman Pai of the FCC. Um, I'm also a board member of CTIA, so I spend significant time on uh, hoping and pushing for uh, digital infrastructure to be a part of any fulsome in infrastructure bill. If 100 years ago it was bridges and tunnels, today will be digital. And it's really critical to enable us to continue to move forward as a society to enable those things, Ben, like, again, healthcare, 150 million x-rays a year, how much easier with digital infrastructure. So I believe there is bi broad bipartisan support for infrastructure, especially for digital infrastructure, and I'm, I'm optimistic we'll see it. Good. Well, I certainly hope you're correct about that because the, the needs are significant. I want to just switch uh, to the general topic of ESG investing in general, which has been, uh, you know, hot buzzword for a while. And uh, in fact, you know, is, is happening in, in many regards. Um, and I'll ask each of the panelists to talk about this uh, a little bit. I'm wondering, you know, to what extent are we really seeing capital allocated uh, in this ESG strategy that, you know, focuses on sustainability and, you um, you know, economic uh, inclusion and the environment, uh, or, you know, is it just uh, sort of corporate investment speak to, to sound good, but not actually uh, really happening, um, you know, in a way that both uh, kind of grows businesses and, uh, you know, gives returns and contributes to issues like uh, climate change and inequality. If we could start with Mark on that one, the extent to which, you know, ESG is a real thing that's happening or something that we just like to talk about. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think it's a real thing. I mean, it's also a bit of a fad right now uh, in that there's huge money going into it in a relatively indiscriminate way, but I, but we believe it's, it, it is a real thing. Uh, and 
we, we, if you do the work and you look at the uh, long-term performance of companies, uh, the value creation, then it's very correlated with the ESG factors that matter. And that, that's the key thing. There's no point in uh, looking at, uh, for example, you know, a, a bank and looking at the bank's water consumption. That doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, but it does make a lot of difference for, say, a textile manufacturer or a, or a pulp and paper manufacturer. Uh, so the, the things that you, you've got to look at the factors that really matter uh, for those companies and how, how they're dealing with them. Uh, and yeah, and it is the environmental factors, it is the social factors, it is the governance factors uh, that matter. On governance, I mean, I'll bring up one related issue, which is diversity. Uh, and that is particularly relevant in the pandemic right now because the burden that's fallen on women in the workforce is particularly acute. Uh, because for, for, uh, you know, for society reasons, they end up generally taking the burden of uh, childcare more than men. Uh, and when you look at the impact that uh, schools being closed and uh, you know, other, uh, other burdens being put on women, during this pandemic, it's caused a, a big, a potentially really big reversal on all the gains that have been made on women's participation in the workforce uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. So you're seeing, according to McKinsey, 25% of women in North America are thinking about uh, downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce. And you've seen much, m many more women uh, leave the workforce during the uh, during this pandemic than uh, than men. So it's, it's a real uh, challenge at the moment. And the reason why we focus on it is because we see diverse boards and diverse senior management teams as highly correlated with the long-term performance of companies. And we, we vote, we've been voting with our feet on this one. So with, um, uh, we've been voting in Canada for several years against boards that don't have women on the board. Uh, and we've now wrapped that up to uh, companies that don't have uh, more than uh, one woman on the board. And we've uh, taken that out globally as well to vote against companies uh, around the world in, in, our, in the proxy voting seasons for who, who don't have uh, women on the board. Uh, and we, you know, again, it's a fundamental belief. This is not just about, you know, it's a good thing to do. We, we see when you control, we, we've done our own studies across 3,600 companies. We've controlled for every other factor. And when you look at it, uh, the uh, participation of women on boards does uh, is highly correlated with long-term uh, value creation by those companies. So it's it's something that uh, you know we're we're very focused on making sure that this pandemic doesn't uh, create a reversal in the gains that have been made there because I think it would be bad for board decision making, company decision making, and long-term value creation. Uh, so, so something we're focused on in the long term. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for making those points. I've also been troubled by those numbers on uh, women and participation in the workforce in the wake of uh, COVID, uh, as well as all the studies that do indicate that uh, you get better performance from boards that are more diverse and, and have more women on them. Um, so those are very useful points. Kate, I want to go to you uh, on this topic because obviously tax uh, plays into this a lot and tax departments are playing a role in uh, corporate you know, ESG uh, efforts. Um, where do you see this uh, going and the extent to which, uh, from a tax perspective, it's uh, kind of a critical element of uh, what corporations are doing right now? Well, thanks, Ben. Let me bring it back to Massachusetts. I think it was Abigail Adams who said, be good and do good. And I think most companies really want to keep it that simple. And recently this winter, the World Economic Forum released uh, 27 measures where they're encouraging companies to really look at long-term value. And I think that is a real game changer and a lot of companies are spending time on this. It's a group of financial and non-financial measures and it focuses on an array of things, you know, focused on their employees and people and what they can do in that regard. And then also what they can do to uh, really help out on the societal front and do more in the communities that they serve. And tax is really important to that. So part of the, the 27 measures is that uh, companies are being asked to report more on the taxes that they pay. And so um, that's an interesting measure, a lot more transparency and companies are really 
more than willing to um, you know to share that information in addition a lot of companies want to talk about the taxes that they're responsible for that are also admitted into the systems and so these would be the taxes paid by their vendors or their customers as well as their employees so really trying to look at um, the ecosystem of what a company does for a community uh, sort of holistically and so I think that this whole long-term value measures are really important and really aligned to, to ESG. Yeah, very good. Thank you for that. Um, Jeffrey, do you want to weigh in on this one, uh, the extent to which you know, ESG is um, you know, a real uh, thing that can both make the world better and offer uh, people better returns, or is there too much money chasing too little in the way of uh, potential returns and uh, just sort of used as a uh, kind of happy talk buzzword? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, be careful about checking the box on things like this. Uh, if there's one thing that we have, we we, we know, uh, I said authenticity is really critical. So if you're saying you're doing things around inclusion and diversity, you better be doing things around inclusion and diversity. If you say you're doing some things uh, to make the world a better place through sustainable investing, you should be making sure that you're doing that and delivering on that promise. It, it'll take some time. I, I think where I, where I, where I come out on this is again both. I look at the head, the heart, and the hands. Uh, and uh, if if you can't get it through your heart that it's right to be more to, to run a more inclusive organization or to invest more inclusively, uh, where inclusivity is a core value that you want to make in your investments, then use your head. And and if your your head will tell you that when you look at uh, when you look at racial diversity, uh, we're going to be majority minority in this country in the next decade. Uh, and the, the up and coming uh, 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 next generation is way more tolerant and open ended to the way that, that people uh, think that are different than the way they look. So I talked to my own kids. They have a much better perspective on what's happening in, uh, in their communities uh, among people that don't look like them than maybe I did. And so that that element is, is going to be critical to driving your long term economic success or said in the obverse, if you don't get around uh, the fact that inclusion and diversity are core businesses, uh, uh, core business initiatives that you have to undertake in a decade, you're going to be obsolete because the people that embrace that will have innovated in ways you'll never have considered. So this is not checking the box on diversity. This is bringing diverse views into the room and then having the guts to listen and figure out which of those diverse views can actually advance your organization, can help you to think about places where you can invest to generate a rate of return. Uh, and again, I, I think that that's not just in the finance business, it's in every business, and we're seeing it uh, over and over again. Uh, the, 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 the outputs that everybody uses to say that uh, those that are more ESG-centric uh, generate better ROEs, that's, that's sort of the scoreboard. Uh, that, that is true. But when you get to, to the next layer deeper, it makes great economic sense to be more inclusive and have more diverse views, whether it's in your boardroom or, it, or in your management team. And there's a bunch of us that are uh, on that journey. Some are earlier than others. Uh, but if, if you don't get there over the next decade, you're just going to probably be obsolete. And so I, I just think that's the way we kind of think about it. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then, Andrew, to you, I guess you could speak uh, sort of the middle market approach uh, to this and, uh, you know, really focusing on these ESG goals and the extent to which that's happening and the extent to which you allocate capital to companies that uh, that are doing that. What's your view? So, Ben, thanks for the question. Um, you phrase a question, I think, in terms of corporations, um, given we back families, founders and entrepreneurs and ESG has been part of our playbook since day one. We think about communities and families. Uh, our day stops and starts with Ogden, Utah, Ernie, Texas, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, Austin, Texas, places where we work with families. And I'd say this, which is ESG is, is a great way to measure not non-financial inputs into our investment decisioning. It's a complete no brainer. Everyone should do it. Um, we tend to see that many of the things that go into the reporting criteria, some of which Mark mentioned, uh, uh, are there in the cultures of these middle market companies? Are they doing the right thing to support their communities? Do they practice stakeholder capitalism? And with regard to what Jeffrey said, we completely agree. Uh, a couple of years ago, we reached out to, we think one of the world's greats, Billie Jean King. Um, Billie's been a pioneer, uh, uh, not only on the tennis court, but in the boardroom, and has a great job of really teaching us through her consulting practice 
about the things we can do uh, to be more inclusive, uh, to promote equity, and, and, um, and end up in a better place. Yeah, thank you uh, for that. Um, we've got you know 15 minutes or so left. I want to encourage folks watching. If you have questions uh, for our esteemed panelists, please do send them in. And I said we'd spend a little time on regulation and the role that it could play in making finance a force for good, whether we need uh, further regulation around the globe to encourage uh, capital allocation in ways that deal with uh, global warming and economic inequality and, and some of the other issues, or the market will continue to allocate resources uh, in that way without uh, the hand of government coming in. And I want to kind of hear from everybody uh, on that topic of, do we need more hey, before we, before regulation? We get to that, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just echo one thing that, that Andrew said that is, Please. that is, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, you know, was such an instructive uh, discussion. So I hosted the CEO of Macy's on a round table discussion around uh, how they've embraced inclusion and diversity in their organization. And I, I commended uh, them on embracing Billy Porter. Uh, yeah. who is a, a gay black man uh, who has been become, in many ways, the spokesman for gay black men. I've known Billy since he was in high school. And, you know, he is his truest and most authentic self. There's no, the way you see him. Uh, and I, com I commended him, uh, the CEO of Macy's, for embracing Billy as a spokesperson. And he said to me, well, I don't, I don't need thanks. Uh, Billy actually is a fashionista who has great, insight on where the world is headed and our associates uh the people who work for us uh, uh embrace him as a thought leader and it makes us a more fashion forward organization now yeah no, to me sure, I, came yeah. That, I came at that with my heart because i've known billy for a long time i know exactly what he stands for but they came to it with both their heart and their head and then they did something with their hands where they actually made it a cultural they, they 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 grabbed his cultural icon status and are driving it forward in a very authentic way that's what we're talking about doing here as it relates yeah. to inclusion and diversity and i just think that that makes a lot of sense on every level right no for sure and you make a very good point that this is uh you know something that uh, a lot of corporate macy's uh, can embrace not just because maybe it's uh, um you know politically correct to do but because it's really good business and it will help them and uh uh, particularly for folks who are into fashion and uh, like cultural icons uh, like that. So I, I appreciate that point. It's uh, it's a really good one that's uh, both good business and uh, and good for the future uh, of the world. Um, to get back to the somewhat drier topic of, of regulation than uh, maybe Billy Porter and Macy's, uh, I do want to at least hit on that since we said that we would. Uh, and I, the question is basically, do you expect governments, uh, particularly in the U.S., but elsewhere, to uh, be more forceful in uh, kind of directing capital allocations in this area, or are we moving in that way uh, anyway? And uh, we can start where, wherever you like, but we might as well start with Kate and then we'll go around the room. Okay, I, I do think we'll see governments use uh, regulations, in some cases, again, bringing it back to the, the tax codes around the world. I, I think we see the EU right now came out with a green tax bill and you know really trying to encourage companies to be more focused on sustainability will we see that trend go around the world i think that that's something that you know people have to really think about carbon taxes and you know whether that will help companies do the right thing as it relates to their emissions and so that's a huge issue right now for a lot of our clients yeah very good um and we can uh, go to mark maybe uh thoughts on that and yeah. the role of uh, regulation in this area going forward yeah, well, Kay mentioned uh, carbon tax. I mean, if there's one, one thing you want to do to simulate the transition, the energy transition, and that that putting a, a price on carbon is the, is the key one. So I'm not politically active, you know, advocating for that, but uh, that that would be probably the most powerful thing uh, to to do to move that energy transition much faster. Your money money will follow that very quickly. The uh, uh, the second thing, though, I'd say is don't starve companies of the capital they need to transition. So one of the challenges for you know, the traditional uh, carbon-based energy providers is they need capital for that energy transition. So you want to encourage them to move in that direction. You want to stimulate, you want to create you know, the tax incentives and other incentives for them to move in the direction of uh, low carbon energy production. Uh, but you don't want to just completely cut them off from capital because that'll be counterproductive on doing that. The third thing I'd say is not necessarily regulation, but the consolidation of reporting. Uh, there were 
that I think there's a lot over 800 different ways of reporting uh, climate risk, uh, which is not, not very helpful. There, there's been a consolidation, I think, around the Financial Stability Board's uh, task force on financial uh, disclosure for climate change, uh, CCFD, uh, the, the, uh, uh, and that, the reporting around that uh, methodology has increased and now there's hundreds and hundreds of companies that are now reporting in that way. And that really helps asset owners like us who are trying to figure out what risks we have related to climate in our portfolio. If you have 800 different methodologies, it's just impossible. Uh, so we, we want as, you know, as much consolidation on one methodology so we can understand the risk and then make decisions on that basis. Same thing with ESG, everybody's wrestling with it. There are so many methodologies, at least 400 different methodologies for reporting ESG metrics. Uh, we'd like to see, again, a consolidation. Uh, the the uh, World Economic Forum was mentioned earlier, and that, that is, uh, I think, a, a very uh, productive effort involving all the, uh, the big accounting firms and other players to try and consolidate metrics. Uh, we particularly like the uh, Sustainable uh, Accounting S Standards Board, the SASB uh, reporting around ESG. But the more we can consolidate it down to a methodology that works, both for companies and for investors, and this is the challenge generally, is that uh, the methodology that works in particular industries uh, it can be different and, uh, and, and it may not work for investors as well. So I think trying to get you know, down to minimum number of methodologies uh, would be really productive for financial markets then move capital in in the best direction for these metrics, which everybody agrees generally makes sense. It's when you get down to the weeds, it's a real challenge. Yeah, I know that's a very good point, the extent to which there are so many multiple measures of uh, ESG uh, performance and the rest of it makes it difficult to um, kind of follow who's uh, performing well and, and who's not. Um, Andrew, uh, your, your thoughts on this topic of uh, you know, further government regulation to drive the idea of uh, capital markets as a force for good or are they uh, self-correcting? Yeah, look, I, I love regulation when it helps establish um, uh, conduct and risk frameworks. Uh, I don't like regulation when it starts directing capital. And so we can think of a couple of examples, the EU proposal on the table, supportive of uh, ESG, Mark's referencing that, I think, I think that's great. Uh, if we had a regulation that said all of a sudden we all had to invest in electric cars, we wouldn't have Tesla today. So I think tax subsidies, other government incentives can solve where capital goals goes. Uh, of the trust and transparency that comes from regulation. So we trust doing business with each other out of that come, jo come jobs and other societal benefits. Yeah, very good. Um, we're down about five minutes. I wanna give Jeffrey a quick chance to weigh in on this one and then grab a couple of audience questions uh, that come in before we uh, wrap up. Um, Jeff, your thoughts on uh, you know the regulatory framework as it relates to capital markets as a force for good. Yeah, so I, I, I'm a Jobs Act uh, acolyte. I was actively involved in, in that. And so I would say anybody who's thinking about legislation, uh, we should think about what you want to achieve and not what you don't want to achieve. I, I think sometimes we think about regulation as limiting um, people's activity. Uh, and, and what I would say is, you know, there's this, the Jobs Act is probably a best example of if you just uh, streamline things a little bit because you want something specific like the formation of capital for small companies. Um, once you clear that pathway, a number of will come in and figure out who the winners and losers are, and it can create a great marketplace that ultimately creates jobs and great innovation. Uh, that's sort of a prototypical piece of regulation, legislation that enable that is an enabler. Uh, and so whoever's running the governments around the world should really be thinking about things like that. Again, I'm very much pro formation of private capital uh, because at the end of the day, um, ROE is a really, really good way to make sure capital doesn't get allocated uh, wrongly. Uh, and if you can augment that uh, with, with, where you're, you're having capital do a real public good um, and driving ROEs at the same time, you're going to get the outcomes you want. Yeah, very good. Thank you for that. Um, got a couple of questions from the audience. Thank you for submitting them, those who are, are watching us. Uh, and uh, one of them, which is interesting, and anybody can jump in on this, is uh, somebody says, would love to hear more about the role of family offices and the capital they control in this context of um, you know, capital uh, markets as a force for good. So whoever wants to weigh in on family offices, sure. please do. 
Ben, ben, I'm happy to take that. Um, we spent a lot of time with family offices. I'm sure others uh, uh, on the panel do as well. Uh, what we've seen over time is some great family businesses turn into some great family offices and take a lot of those values they established in their own business and apply that across a, a, a broader spectrum of, of investments uh, while still maintaining those values. So we see the role of the family office growing over time. We spend a lot of time with those family offices. Uh, and there's, I'd say this, there's a lot of wisdom that sits inside those family offices well beyond the capital that I think we and others uh, tap into. Uh, I think as Mark has you know, talked about CPPIB as an asset manager, uh, um, I think you'll start to see these family offices also as asset managers. Gotcha. Um, we'll let you just have the word on that because we only have a couple of minutes left and I want to just hit this other one that's uh, come in and maybe just take the end of it because it's a, a nice question to perhaps end on and if everybody could just maybe 30 seconds uh, in your response. Uh, the final part of this very long question is how will 21st century um, post-pandemic finance meet the moment, uh, which is to mean, you know, uh, yawning gaps in economic inequality, the rest of it. Uh, you know, final thought briefly from each of you on uh, how finance is going to meet this moment, which is a challenging moment for all of us in so many ways. And we'll just start with Kate and then we'll, we'll go around. Yeah, I think that finance will meet the moment by focusing on long-term value and not always just optimizing the short-term return but focused on societal good like carbon emissions and uh, all of the social injustices and really, again, creating more jobs for people. Yeah, okay, very good. Uh, and uh, we can go to Mark. Yeah, I, th I think we touched on a lot of the themes. The only two we haven't touched on that I just give a shout out on in addition to one, uh, infrastructure, private ownership of infrastructure it's a it's a funny conundrum, particularly uh, in the U.S., where a lot of uh, infrastructure society expects it to be owned by governments at various levels. The more we can have infrastructure in private hands, the more capital can be uh, directed towards infrastructure development. And the second, probably unpopular theme, I'd say, is globalization, uh, which is in reversal and has been since the global financial crisis. I think the more we can uh, continue to keep borders open for capital and borders open for trade and investment, I think the more the world will benefit. Got it. we got about uh, 30 seconds for each left. Andrew, a proposing thought on this topic. Sure, Ben. We'll meet the moment by being there for those families, founders, and entrepreneurs in, in the middle market. It's being there every day and not just being capital, but being know-how, bringing our skill to the table uh, as a society. And I think this will be the engine that helps pull us out of uh, the pandemic. Got it. And uh, Jeffrey, it looks like you will have the last word here. Less financial engineering, more investing in people. Uh, it's, uh, I'll just say, um, you know, the, this crisis was not caused by the financial system. And I think a lot of what happened in finance uh, really in the last decade was, was a function of what happened in 2008. And most of the leaders I know uh, are, are trying to figure out ways to help. Um, the leadership of financial institutions is all about trying to figure out ways to help at this point. And I think if we focus on doing the right thing for people, um, we have a lot of, a lot of ground we can cover in the not too distant future. Yeah, appreciate that. And it's a uh, perfect timing in our, uh, COVID-19 working from home era that, uh, somebody has arrived and is mowing my lawn right now, just as we finish up. And so hopefully it won't get picked up by anyone. Uh, but these are the things we deal with and I'm, I'm glad it's happening at the end. Um, thank you so much to, uh, Kate, Jeffrey, Mark and Andrew for a, a wonderful discussion for everybody who uh, tuned in to listen uh, to the Milken Institute for having us. Uh, it's been terrific and definitely hope to see everyone uh, live in Los Angeles uh, next year, God willing. Uh, stay safe out there, everyone, and thank you for being here. Thanks, thank you and be safe. Thanks.